now we'll get to hear from Dr. Ronald Melnick, who is the retired senior tech, uh, toxicologist at the National Institutes of Health um, that just completed that $30 million study on radio frequency and cell phones and indeed found clear evidence that this is not something we should be exposing ourselves or our children to. He has a, a wonderful career uh, working for our highest posts in our government at the White House Office of Science and Technology. He served on that international agency for research on cancer and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He's received the American Public Health Association's David R. Paul Award for Science-Based Advocacy in Public Health. And as I mentioned, he was the lead designer on the National Toxicology Program Study. So Dr. Melnick. Thank you for the invitation to speak here, and thank you for the large crowd that came out to uh, hear these presentations. Uh, what I want to talk about is the utility of the National Toxicology Program study for assessing human health risks. The National Toxicology Program is considered the premier institute in the world for developing information that can be used to determine human health risks. And that's one of the main objectives of that program. It is headquartered at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences located in North Carolina. It is the one institute of the National Institutes of Health that's not located in Bethesda, Maryland. So the National Toxicology Program reports directly to the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. The director is the director of both the national NTP and IEHS. There's a lot of acronyms in the government. Sorry about that. But it also is composed of the FDA as a component. The main one is the NIEHS, which is part of NIH, and also Center for Disease Con <coughs> Control or the of the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. There's also an oversight committee, which includes agencies such as the FDA, EPA. Uh, I don't need to go through all the other. OSHA's Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Now, the National Toxicology Program receives nominations from anybody for study of agents that might impact on human health. These nominations can come from universities, the public, anybody here could write a nomination. It would require a little justification, uh, labor industry, but the most of them come from the federal and state agencies in particular. The National Cancer Institute uh, is probably first. FDA is also a nominator. The studies on cell phone radio frequency radiation emitted from wireless communication devices came to the NTP from a nomination by the Food and Drug Administration. And the request was for studies of toxicity and carcinogenicity so that studies would be provide data that could be used to assess risks to human health. That was what they asked for. The reason was that at that time, the use of cell phones was increasing astronomically in the human population, and exposure guidelines were based on protection from acute injury from thermal effects. Heating was the one effect that was considered to be a known effect of radiofrequency radiation. But the concern was maybe it's not protective against non-thermal effects with long-term exposure. The FDA, FCC developed exposure guidelines, which are 20 years old. These were designed, again, to protect against adverse effects that might occur in tissues or, or body temperature of, of an increase of one degree centigrade. They exposed monkeys to radio frequency radiation. Did some modeling, came up with an exposure rate SAR is specific absorption rate. This is the rate at which the energy enters into the body and into various tissues. The SAR was considered 4 watts per kilogram 
as the level of which uh, heating might start to occur. And anything below that was considered to be non-important to health. But to set exposure limits for the general population, they pick a number, they divide it by 50, and said that the average whole body exposure could be 0.08 watts per kilogram. And if you looked at your phones, as David asked you to do, you may have seen a much higher level, probably 1.2 or so. This is averaged over any one gram of tissue. Now, this is an important point, the difference between whole body and averaged over one gram of tissue, because when it's whole body, you don't have a sense of what is the dose in specific organs within the body. So, for example, if this is the antenna of a phone, if I hold it next to my head, this is where the radiation is. If I divide that dose by the rest of my body, I'm saying that the dose to my brain is being diluted out because I'm adding all my feet, my thighs, everything else. <laughs> so the 1.6 watts is the one which we're really focusing on because that's the one that we're most concerned about in terms of holding and where the antenna is in relationship to uh, people's usage. The NTP conducts their studies in animals. Animals are used for assessing human health risks, and this is a current practice and accepted by the EPA, uh, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the FDA. They use animals for uh, drug development. And that, the reason for this is that the processes of disease are similar. It's unethical to uh, test for carcinogenicity in people. Every known human carcinogen is carcinogenic in animals when tested adequately. The exposures can be controlled so that we can eliminate potential confounders with something else the cause of any type of effect. And animal studies can eliminate the need to wait for sufficient cancer data before implementing public health policies. Uh, cancer can have a long latency, and rather than waiting to see if the population is affected, animal studies can uh, enhance that. So when I began this project, I had two simple objectives. One, test the hypothesis or the assumption at that time that cell phone radiation at essentially non-thermal exposure intensities was incapable of causing any adverse health effects. As David mentioned, the thought at that time was, and the assumption, which we were well aware, that if it's not thermal, there could not be an adverse health effects. So let's test that hypothesis. And if we saw an effect, what is the dose response relationship so that data would be available to assess human health risk? So th there were multiple aspects to this study. These studies were conducted in what are called reverberation chambers. It's essentially a large, it's a room. It's like a large microwave oven, but it has an antenna in it, which is emanating the radio frequency radiation. And there are paddles that are stirring the electromagnetic fields to create a homogeneous environment. That was first demonstrated. We then did what we call a thermal pilot study. What are the effects of radiation and how high will, could we go to see that one degree rise in, of centigrade in rats and mice? We used modulated radio frequency radiation. The modulations are what the networks use for multiple access. You may see your network is either CDMA or GSM. These are two different types of modulations. Uh, we use 900 megahertz and 1900 megahertz since those are the ra range, the ra areas in which uh, cell phones communicate with the cell towers. Uh, we did a pre-chronic study just to see how uh, animals would do prior to conducting the chronic study. The chronic study then was to ter determine the effects of chronic exposure, including carcinogenicity, of GSM and CDMA modulated cell phone radio frequency radiation. We had 90 animals per group. Now, risk is something that you think, may, or, you think or may not think about, but risk is what is the likelihood of 
one in a hundred, one in a thousand, one in a hundred thousand, one in a million. With 90 animals per group, this is an insensitive assay because we need 5% or 10% response rate to say we see an effect. So we have to challenge that type of one degree temperature rise. The SARs in rats were 0, 1.5, 3, and 6 watts per kilogram because the thermal pilot study showed that the exposure of rats to those levels, they were able to maintain their temperature within one degree centigrade. The exposures began during pregnancy on gestation day five and continued until necropsy at 108 weeks. Now, the NTP has defined what they mean by levels of evidence of carcinogenic activity. Clear evidence means there is a dose-related increase in cancers. Uh, they may be benign and malignant. Some evidence means there was an increase in tumors and it was re related to the agent to which the animals were exposed. Equivocal doesn't mean nothing, it means there's an increase in tumors, but it may or may not be agent related. And other factors besides statistics comes into play. For example, are these common tumors, uncommon tumors? Uh, are there also precancerous lesions or uh, hyperplasias at the same site? The findings just summarizing here on the carcinogenicity was that there was clear evidence for both GSM and CDMA for heart schwannomas. Schwannoma is a Schwann cell which wraps around the nerve. This is the insulator of the nerve. Uh, there was clear evidence for both in male rats in brain. There was also some evidence which is agent related for gliomas. These are the glial cell tumors in male rats. And as you can see, there were also hyperplasias, which are lesions that are precancerous, pre-tumorous lesions also observed. There was equivocal evidence, which meant that it may or may not be agent related, but there were signs of increased response. So what are the key findings? There were others as well. Cell phone radiation caused cancers and preneoplastic lesions in the heart and brain. There was also measurement of DNA damage in the brain cells of rats and mice. There was a heart muscle disease called cardiomyopathy, which was dose-related increase. And as I mentioned, the rats were exposed in utero. Uh, there was reduced birth weights. Another conclusion is the assumption that Non-ionizing radiation cannot cause cancer or other health effects other than tissue heating is wrong. So comparing this to the IARC monograph, which came out in 2000, uh, the, the meeting was held in 2011. Uh, as I said, the NTP found cancers in the heart, schwannomas, and brain gliomas. The IARC evaluation was that it was possibly carcinogenic to humans. This was based on increases in two, study, in two overall studies for glioma and acoustic neuroma. This is a Schwann cell tumor of the nerve in the ear canal. This was both in the what's called the interphone study. That was a multinational uh, study. I, I, I'm not sure exactly how many, approximately 10 countries participated. The US didn't. And in Sweden by Hardell, uh, found numerous uh, reports of his case control study showing increases in schwannomas and gliomas. So what are the expected next steps? Well, as I mentioned, this was nominated to the NTP by FDA. So now they need to do their job. Uh, the nomination to conduct the quantitative risk assessment so that FCC can develop health protective exposure standards. FCC has the guidelines, but they're not health-based. They're based on heating. FDA has that data, but they refuse to use it. Because of the widespread use of cell phones, even a small increase in cancer risk would have a serious health impact. So as I said, what is risk? Is it one in 1,000, one in 100,000? If it's one in 100,000, that's still a lot of people when you consider 
is approximately 5 billion or 4 billion users worldwide. And precautionary principles should be promoted, not if you are concerned. The health agencies need to promote uh, pre precautionary principles, especially for children and pregnant women, because the cancer risks may be greater in children due to the increased penetration, which was shown by others, of cell phone radiation within the brains of children, and the developing nervous system is more susceptible to tissue damaging agents. We know this from numerous studies with chemical agents. So a lesson learned, we should no longer assume that any current or future wireless technology, including 5G, which is being rolled out, is safe without adequate testing, because to do otherwise is unethical. Thank you.